happened to go to a church service and on a Sunday I was sitting in the back and I'll never forget it. There's this pastor, his name is Joey, and uh, he was preaching out of Psalms chapter one. And if you read Psalm chapter one, it, uh, it says this and it goes, oh, the joy of those who are righteous. Oh, the joy of those who are well, the Lord's pretty much. And he was preaching on it and it says, but the wicked, the wicked, they hang out with other wicked people. They sit with them, they stand, they talk. And then he was talking about how, aren't you missing your father? And I just remember as Pastor Joey, as he was praying, I was sitting in the back and the best way that I could describe it is I just started missing God. I really just started to miss him. And then the pastor comes and he makes a beeline to me and he grabs me and he goes, RJ, how are you doing? And I was like, oh, it's going good. Fire, I'm totally lying. He's all, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm, I'm good, you know, I'm good. Fire. And then he asked me a third time and he said, RJ, how are you doing? and then I just broke down. When I was about one years old, my mom and dad, um, they were actually about to get a divorce. Uh, my dad, he was raised in church, but during the season in his life, he, he would even tell you that he was lukewarm. Um, and him and my mom, my mom was not raised in church, so they ended up getting married. They had me, and already at, uh, when I was about one years old, they wanted to get a divorce and they were gonna call it quits. And right around this time, my dad's youth pastor and his wife heard about how they were gonna get a divorce. And so this youth pastor drives over to my parents' house, their one bedroom apartment, knocks on the door, and my dad answers the door and he, he comes in and, and he said, hey, I heard you guys are gonna get a divorce. My dad's like, yeah, and, and the pastor goes, well, where's the divorce papers? And he had matches. And uh, he said, you know what? You're not gonna call it quits. We're gonna light these divorce papers on, pi on fire because I believe Roy, uh, my dad, he said, I believe Roy, God still has a plan for you and for Kelly. And also not only you, but your son right here. And uh, God's not done with you. I'm so thankful because my parents, they, they listen to that pastor. I'm thankful for that pastor and his wife. And now to this day, my mom and dad have been serving Jesus for 32 years. They're children's pastors, reaching hundreds of kids every single week. My dad uh, runs paintball camps and he was an amazing man of God. And now I'm the oldest of five. My brother Tyler, uh, Ashlyn, Madison, John, they wouldn't have even been born. And so I'm so thankful. But yeah, that's, that's the household that I was, uh, I was raised in. All I knew was Jesus. Um, we went to church every single week, uh, Sundays, Wednesdays. I went to church camps. Um, I watched Veggie Tales. If you're if you're a church kid, you know about Veggie Tales, Bible Man, Superbook. I I like Superbook before Superbook was even cool, right? And uh, and Pharaoh Pharaoh. So so that was me. And all I knew was Jesus. Uh, a lot of people talk about how maybe when they uh, they were raised in church that, that they just kind of went because their parents made them, but, but it was actually the opposite for me. Like I remember being four years old and my earliest memory of Jesus actually asking my mom, we were at my, gran my grandpa's house and asked my mom, mom, I, I wanna give my life to Jesus. And it wasn't something that she was saying or anything. I just, I, I just had it in my heart. And my mom was like, here, grandpa's oh, okay. And so she took me into the bathroom. That was the only private place. And I remember kneeling down and my mom praying and me asking Jesus to come into my life as a kid. As a kid, I was also on a worship team and, and I was uh, given a, a role of like leadership, even in, even in kids church. And I'd be able to pray for people and sometimes I'd be able to speak. And I was on this worship team to where we would uh, travel up and down California, speaking at camps and worshiping at camps. And I remember when I was about 12 years old being at one of these camps. And this, I'll, I'll never forget this. Um, I was at a camp, it was in Santa Cruz, California, the, in the mountains of Santa Cruz, California, and the pastor was preaching, and uh, it, was, it was a night that was just powerful. I don't know if you've ever sensed like the weighty presence of God in the service, but it was so powerful to where um, at the altar call, kids were crying, kids were manifesting, I believe kids were, demons were, were getting cast out. It was just, it was wild at a kid's camp. And it was one of those moments when God's presence was so thick to where it was almost kind of scary. And I remember that the pastor got on the mic, his name was Jason, and over the mic he calls and he said, RJ, where, where's RJ? Some, someone get me RJ, I need him. And um, he didn't know this, but at the time, uh, I was actually all the way hiding in the back of the, of the um, auditorium is at a summer camp, it was at night, and I made sure I looked around, no one saw me, and I was underneath a pew. And at that same moment, I was calling out to God, and I felt like He was calling me into full-time ministry when I was about 12. 
And um, I was having this moment and I was like, God, I want to be a pastor. I want to tell people about you. I, I really felt like he was calling me. Well, right as I got that out of my mouth, right, or even as I was just uttering it, that's when Pastor Jason was saying, hey, where's RJ? I need him. And so me being on the worship team and going to camps, you know, going up and down and kind of serving, even as a kid, uh, I thought that he wanted like water or something. I thought he was up there praying for kids at the altar. And so I got up and I ran up to the front and I was like, yeah, what do you need? And he grabbed me by my head. And he said, God told me to pray for you right now and that he's um, calling you. And, um, and so that is when I was 12 years old, I always knew and I was walking with the Lord and I had this sweet communion with Jesus. It wasn't fake, right? And um, I think that's why it made it uh, so much harder when I backslid or when I, uh, when I walked away from him. So 12 years old, I'm solid. I'm like, this is why I'm here. I know this is my calling. And God set me apart. He marked me on that day. Um, then junior high was good. High school, I'm serving the Lord, still ministering. Me and my buddies, we go to movies sometimes. And uh, I would, even after the movies, we'd try to witness the people. And I do like this whole way of the master thing. I don't know if you know what that is. but And, uh, and God was blessing it. I would see people cry and I'd tell them about Jesus and God was using me. But then I went to, it was actually, it's ironic, a Christian high school. The devil's after Christians, right? And then my freshman year, I was solid with Jesus. But right about my sophomore year and my junior Junior year, things started to change. I was playing football, and I was hanging out with this crowd that um, that I usually wouldn't hang out with. And I actually, it doesn't look like it now, but I, I started to get good at football. I started to get noticed. I was fast, um, and I believe that brought it some pride into my life. Um, I also started doing rodeo. I started hanging out with some bull riding friends. I started to bull ride, and then before I knew it, I started to chew tobacco. I got this like bravado. I'm like, oh, I'm a running back. I'm fast. Uh, I'm going to go to college and play football. And then also during this time, I got into a relationship with a girl. And this is where things you like, you've ever heard of like, you give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. Uh, I remember um, getting into this relationship with a girl who was not a believer, didn't have the same morals as me, didn't know Jesus the way I knew Jesus and uh, fell into sexual sin. What that did was it didn't just open up a door for me to be addicted to sexual sin and pornography, but it also, I started rebelling against my parents, my parents who loved me. I started re uh, rebelling. I remember a pastor one time, I had some great pastors, great youth pastors and children. I remember a pastor actually looking at me going, what are you doing? You know, and I just, I started to become numb and rebelling, leaving the house. I started drinking. I mean, it was just crazy. It just switched. And I remember at this time in my life that I, uh, like after watching pornography or actually mess after messing around with a girl, I felt so much conviction and shame. And I remember crying. I remember maybe if, if you're there, you know, it's like, man, God, how could I do this? You've been so good to me. And I felt shame and guilt, but then I do it again and I do it again and I do it again. And it got to the point to where my senior year, I messed up my shoulder playing football. My grades were horrible. I barely graduated college, or excuse me, high school. I barely graduated. I lost any thought about playing football, scholarships. I uh, got my heart broken from all, all these girls and uh, was listening to horrible music. All, I, was, I was a worship leader as a kid, and now I'm listening to this filthy music. Now looking back, I'm like, I can't even believe some of the things I was listening to. But then I got to this point to where after I graduated high school, this, I knew that it was wrong, but I started to turn my back. It was almost like a Jonah moment for me. I knew that I was called to be a minister. I was Mark, this and that, but I decided I wanted to become a firefighter. Now, listen, if you're in the fire service, I tell people this fire, the fire service is amazing if you're called to do it. But for me, I know for, for a fact that I was running from God. So after graduating high school, I focused just on the fire service. I graduated from fire academy. I became an EMT. And this, I would say, was was probably the worst time in my life. Uh, on the outside, it looked good. People thought, you know, oh, he's going to be a firefighter. He's going to do something with his life. But deep down inside, I was uh, I was drinking. I moved in with another firefighter. We were partying, partying on the weekends, inviting all these people over, messing around with girls, doing things. I even started experimenting with steroids and just doing all this crazy stuff. And um, it was in this moment the worst of my life. And this is how you know it was bad too. So that when I was always had got convicted or I was feeling numb at this time of my life, when I was sinning and doing all these things, turning my back on God, I, I, I was numb. 
I, I didn't have any conviction. And that was probably the scariest part for me because I went from being so close to the Holy Spirit to where I feel like I grieved him so much to where now I couldn't even hear him. And it was scary. But I say all of that. It's the exciting part. This is exactly where the Lord met me. And it's exactly um, where he chose to really bring me back. And so I happened to go to a church service on a weekend uh, when I was firefighting. And I, I went and on a Sunday I was sitting in the back. And I'll never forget it. There's this pastor, his name is Joey. And uh, he was preaching out of Psalms chapter one. And if you read Psalm chapter one, it, uh, it says this and it goes, Oh, the joy of those who are righteous. Oh, the joy of those who are well, the Lord's pretty much. And he was preaching on it. And it says, but the wicked, the wicked, they hang out with other wicked people. They sit with them, they stand, they talk. And then he was talking about how, aren't you uh, missing your father? And he was talking about, and I just remember as Pastor Joey, as he was praying, I was sitting in the back and the best way that I could describe it is I just started missing God. I really just started to miss him. And I started having like these flashbacks of like, man, I was called. God, I loved you. I had this sweet presence with you. And now I've just blown it. I've become wicked. I've become lukewarm. I don't even feel your presence anymore. And I remember having these thoughts in my head and then I just felt like God was just drawing me and just trying to pull me. And so the pastor gave the altar call and I remember I I got up and I was kind of sitting in the back. There was a bunch of people at the altar and I was kind of just standing in the back. And then the pastor comes and he makes a beeline to me and he grabs me and he goes, RJ, how are you doing? And I was like, oh, it's going good. Fire. I'm totally lying. I'm all firefighting is going good. Everything, you know, and he goes, he's all, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm, I'm good, you know, I'm good. Fire. And then he asked me a third time and he said, RJ, how are you doing? And then I just broke down and I was crying. And it was in that moment to where it's like, if, you, if you've ever heard of the prodigal son story in Luke, Jesus said that when the son came to his senses, there was a son who was raised in, in the family, but he squandered his inheritance. He went out and he spent it on, on wild living and on women. And then finally one day, he looks down and he's eating with the pigs and he came to his senses. And that was honestly that moment that day in that church for me where I finally was just like, what am I doing, God? And I came to my senses. And the thing that rocks me the most about this moment, and I tell people this all the time, is that when, when I walked up to that altar, I was like expecting God to like spank me. I was expecting my father to have like a lightning bolt, right? And be like, RJ, you idiot, like you knew better. It's one thing for uh, unbelievers to be out there and then come to the Lord. It's a whole nother thing. I, I felt like personally when, when I was in it to where I spit on Jesus, I ran from him. I knew better. I was raised in church. I went to a Christian high school. Like, God, how can you forgive me? You know? And then I remember that um, in that moment when the pastor was praying for me, all I felt was no punishment, no anger. All I felt was just an overwhelming love of God. And he really was. He was like, my son, you were lost, but who cares about that? You're found now. You're here. And what's so crazy about God is, I mean, just that week, I was probably screwing around with a girl. Who knows what I was doing just that that week? I was probably drinking, partying, and instantly God forgave me. And he didn't just forgive me. He reinstated me reinstated me. He gave me my calling back, my purpose back, and I doubted it. I remember, I don't know what it is with me encountering God in bathrooms, but I remember I was in a bathroom and it was like right after this happened at the church and God forgave me and I felt this love. And I was like, God, are you calling me back into ministry? Because I felt like he was. I was excited and I was like, I want to be a pastor in this, but I felt so much shame and guilt. And I remember being like, God, are you sure? And there's a verse in the Bible that says the gift and callings of God are without repentance, right? So right when I came back, he forgave me, healed me, delivered me, gave me a calling. And I remember I happened to be have a Bible in the bathroom and it was open. I didn't even like realize where it was. And uh, honest, honest to God truth, I said, God, are you really restoring me? Do you really want me to go into the ministry? Am I, do I still have a calling? And I happened to look down. I don't advise you just opening up your Bible and, and looking at verse, but this time it actually happened. I, I looked down and it was in Jeremiah and this is what it said. It said, this is what the Lord says. 
And I was like, oh, that gets my attention. It says, if you truly return to me, if you return to me, I will restore you. And if you speak good words rather than worthless words, I'll make you my spokesman. And I was like, man, and it just rocked me. I'm like, God, you've called me. And so now I'm still, I'm still in the fire service. I had it in with this chief and now I'm trying to go back to my shifts right? And this is what God did to me. And so I'm trying to go back. I'm like, how am I going to get out of fire service? And all of a sudden the desire of being a firefighter was just gone. I worked so hard to do it and become an EMT, all this. And and I climbed all these ladders. I had it in with the chief and all of a sudden just gone. I didn't want to do it anymore. And I remember going to shifts and I heard on the radio, I think it was on Caleb or something. It's like, do the 30 day challenge. Just listen to worship music. So that's all I'm doing. I'm crying in the car, going to my shifts. And I remember sitting at my shifts and I was having a hard time focused. Probably not good when you're a firefighter. No, I was focusing. I was doing the good. I was doing my work. But I remember when I was alone, just reading a Bible and just crying and just having these encounters with God, just even at my station. And uh, long story short, I was able to end up leaving the fire service. That was a miracle in itself, how God set it up. Um, But I ended up leaving and the pastor that was preaching that Sunday He's like, hey, RJ, would you ever want to work at a gym? The church owned a gym. And I was like, yeah. So I ended up, God opened up a door. And so now I got to work at this gym, listen to worship music every single, every single day, open it up. It was, it was great how God did it. But then I started to minister to everyone who was coming into the doors of the gym. And I started a Bible study right away and I realized, wow, God, you're using me. I was just here in the world and now you forgave me and right away you're using me. I remember praying for people, getting words of knowledge for people. Here's another thing that's really interesting about the Lord is like, I became so hungry for the Bible. I was never, when I was a kid, I loved reading it, but I became so hungry to where I was just devouring it and things started to make sense. I remember waking up in the middle of the night, I call this a supernatural season, a big supernatural season in my life. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and I'd be preaching. I'd be preaching or I'd get sermons. I've, I never like spoke in front of a church at this time. And I remember writing down all these sermons and I would, I would start a Bible study at the gym. People are getting saved. Grown men were coming, crying, telling me their marital problems. I'm like, uh, let's, I don't know, but let's pray. People started to manifest demons. And, um, and during this time, I remember going to some pastors and being like, this is happening. And they're like, oh, that's cool. It's really excited. But I was also during this time getting attacked by demons. And so God became very real, the supernatural. God reinstated me, all this, but also the demonic was getting really ticked off. And I was like, whoa, something's very mad. I remember, I remember, um, so I was addicted to pornography and all this. And I remember there was a season where I decided that I wasn't going to sleep with, with my girlfriend or ex-girlfriend. I wasn't going to look at things. And I remember one night I had this dream. And in the dream, there was this girl that I used to do things with, right? And she came to me in the dream and she was pulling my hand, trying to get me to sleep with her. And I'll never forget this. She was she was pulling, pulling, and I, I ended up yanking my arm and I said, no. And as soon as I said no and pulled away from her, I woke up and I was like half asleep, half awake. And I remember seeing this nine foot dark figure in my room. It was, I really saw it and it was there. And at first I thought it was like my dad standing on the couch in the two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what are you doing? But then I went to say something and I couldn't speak and I couldn't move. And right then and there, I was like, this is a demonic encounter. And the thing, and the best way I could explain it is uh, it looked like the Grim Reaper. Or if you watch ever watch Lord of the Rings, it looked like a ring wraith looking thing. And so it was there and it screamed at me and then it vanished. And I remember at that moment, I just remember thinking like the devil is so ticked off that I came back to Jesus. And that was the dumbest thing that the devil ever did was allow me to see a demon because it just made me crazier for Jesus. And so now I'm going to the gym, I'm preaching. I, I ended up inviting a bunch of friends to my house, my old party animal friends. I'm preaching in, in my parents' house. I started to get these dreams of Africa. Now, I, I was raised in church, but I never have gone on a mission trip, and I didn't really want to. I didn't, that was like a missionary call, like whatever. But I remember, remember having these dreams of Africa and these kids in Africa, and so I started to pray. I was like, God, are you telling me, calling me, uh, am I supposed to go to, on a mission trip to Africa? And I remember it was so crazy, so supernatural. This is all the same uh, couple of months, just supernatural things were happening. I remember I went to Starbucks, 
and my mom was there and she had a friend and it was her sister happened to be in town and I was like oh what do you do well she was a missionary to Tanzania and it was like that and the very next week and she goes hey would you ever want to go to Tanzania and, and intern and so before I knew it I was living in Tanzania for about two and a half months and I just that's really when I was in Africa that's really where God solidified a lot of things in my life I got some really great men men and women of God that were uh, uh, spiritual parents to me prophesied over me I remember being at a school in Africa a children's school and hearing screaming going on in the principal's office and here I am in Tanzania and I'm like what in the world is that and I asked someone and they're like oh that's the principal they're casting a demon out of a kid and I was like what I'm like and they're like oh yeah it's just normal it's not normal for you in America and so during the season um, when I was in Africa I almost started to get upset with myself with family, with friends, and even the American church and with pastors in America. And to be honest, I remember praying. I, I had an opportunity to live in Tanzania. RJ was about to never come back to America, right? I had an opportunity to actually be a missionary there. And uh, I remember praying. I'm like, God, that's what I want to do. But I really felt like the Lord was I'm not going to let you do that. You need to come back to America. And I'm like, God, I don't want to come back to America. America's asleep. For years, I was asleep, you know, and I, I was lukewarm. So, so many Americans were like me, grew up in church or went to a Christian school, private school, and, and they're lukewarm. They, they're not really, you know, even serious about the Lord and they're asleep. But over here in a, a third world country, you know, they're, they're awake. They see demons. They say, all they care about is Jesus. And so I remember the Lord's telling me, RJ, you need to go back to America because I'm going to wake up my church. I'm going to wake up the American church and I want you to be a missionary there. And so I end up coming back to America kind of reluctantly. And right away, I was like, all right, God, let's wake up your church. And so again, I started opening up my, it was at my parents' house. We started opening up their house. And I remember there's this guy, Shane came now, now he's an, an evangelist and my brother-in-law, Jaden, now he's a youth pastor. I remember them coming, getting saved, delivered. We started having all these people fill up my parents' house and people getting healed. And, and it was amazing. And we actually called it the awakening. And so I would go around from, to my party, party animal friends, my old ones be like, like, hey, the Lord said and when I was in Africa that he's waking up the church, that he's going to wake up the church. So come, we called it the awakening. And we are seeing a lot of people wake up. And to this day, there's so much fruit from it. To this day, they're still awake or they're serving the Lord. Amazing. Well, there was this one day, this lady, Laura, came from our church. She said, RJ, have you ever heard of the awakening in Manteca, California? And I said, I, honestly, I've never heard of it. Never heard of it. Never heard of Isaiah Saldivar. She goes, you need to meet this kid because God is waking up people over in Manteca too. And it's in happening with hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people. And so I ended up going to the awakening, the revival it was on Castle Road. And I remember meeting, maybe some of you know, Isaiah Saldivar for the first time. And I remember crying and seeing so many people getting healed, delivered. And I was like, wow, God, what you told me in Africa, I'm actually seeing. You're waking up the remnant. You're waking up the church. And so that was, oh my goodness, that was years ago. I ended up, at this time, I was already ordained. I was a, a pastor, minister when I came back from Africa. And uh, I joined the awakening team um, as, a, as a leader. I met my wife, Cassandra there. My wife, she has a radical testimony. She got saved there, delivered there. Her family got saved. My family was set on fire. And then for the next, I would say eight, nine years, we saw thousands, hundreds and thousands of people get saved, set free, delivered. We, my wife and I, we got married in 2013. We just had our nine year anniversary. We just had our fourth baby. God has been so faithful to us. And um, it's been awakening ever since. And the best thing that ever happened to me was me coming back to Jesus, you know, and um, he really did reinstate me. And to this day, uh, that's what we're still doing. We're still seeing it. We're still pastoring, ministering, seeing so many people come to the Lord and uh, have their own encounter with Jesus. So I'm so thankful that God took me back. Now, Roy, for, for people who are watching right now and have been called mm -hmm. to pastor, mm -hmm. and maybe they're watching right now and, and they're in that place that, that you found yourself in where you were running away. Yeah. What can you say to those people who are watching right now, who are running away, who know somebody who's running away, what can you say to them watching? I can say one thing is um, don't run away. You can't. We know that from the Bible. Even with Jonah, he tried. Um, 
And the biggest thing that you can do is just close, put, close your ears to it and, um, and do your own thing. But God loves you. Um, your Heavenly Father, it is, it's going to be like the prodigal son story. When you come back to him, he's not there with a lightning bolt. He's not there to punish you. He just wants to love you. He wants to heal you. He wants to put a robe on your finger, or excuse me, a robe on your back, a ring on your finger, reinstate you. And he wants to say, my, uh, my lost daughter, my lost son, now you're found. Now you're found. So come back to him. Run back. Run back uh, while you have time. Yeah. Who is Jesus to you? Oh, man. Jesus, he's not just um, some Jewish man uh, that people think about. He's not just uh, the Savior or the Lamb. He's everything. He's, he's life. He's transformed my life. He's my love. He's the reason why I'm here. He's the reason why I wake up in the morning. He's the reason why my, I have kids. I had this fear. I remember I was actually being delivered one time and they were casting demons out of me in my past. And I remember I had this horrible fear that I wasn't going to be able to have kids. It was just demonic. And I remember not telling anyone that. And in the deliverance, it was actually Isaiah. And he's like, Hey, I have this feeling like, I feel like the Holy Spirit told me that you're afraid that you're not going to have kids, but that's a lie from the devil. You're going to have kids. And now we have four, you know what I mean? And, um, I'm just so thankful Jesus has really transformed my life. He's taken me from glory to glory. It's only going to get better. He's touched my wife and, and so many of my friends and my family. And I'm just so thankful. He's my everything. Roy, any last words for people who are watching your testimony right now? Yeah, um, I really feel like in this season of my life, God, uh, as a pastor, as, as leaders in the church, our number one job is to equip to encourage, to correct. Paul told Timothy, correct, rebuke, feed, feed your flock. And so if I can give you any advice from God, the ultimate shepherd is that he loves you. He wants to protect you. But I also believe time is short. I'm not a doomsday preacher, but uh, the early church said that they were in the last day. So I do believe that we are in the last seconds, but we don't have to be afraid of it. But if you're running from God, if you are asleep like I was, man, come back to him. Let him wake you up. It's the best decision I have ever made. Come serve Jesus and he will use you. He will use you. And I also want to say this too. It's not just pastors and leaders in the church that are called. Every single one of you have a calling over your life. Your God has a plan, a purpose for you. You're a piece of the body of Christ. And so come let Jesus love on you and let him use you.